for you. <laughs> well, I was. <laughs> I don't know. Are you any? No. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I grew up in Surf Honey. Hey. How are you? Maybe you were the baby in there. I got so maybe you were the baby in there. I got a walking stick out, put it out so I could walk with it. And I looked and he's walking out the door with it. He's hobbling on it. <laughs> Did that help you? You want to see this picture? Yeah, just pass it back where it came from. Need another one? I'll bring you one. I've got one, thank you. I'll just, if he puts it down, he'll forget it. If he forgets it at home. She said, we used to have one out there. She asked me if it was the same one. I said, it's very much like it if it's not the same one that's out there. It's the same Seems like they were more centered in front of the church in that other one, but you know, I mean, I wonder if I got my shirt on backwards. It feels like I'm not sure. Just wait till you get out. Life is not there. It feels like it's on I don't think it is, but it feels that way. It looks like it's right. It's on right. <laughs> from uh, Nancy Hatfield in regards to her aunt and that donation has arrived uh, I will not for wisdom's sake wisdom from above sake uh, not share the amount that uh, they are giving us I will pass it around and you can look inside the envelope uh, but uh, that's what, what the picture is as you can see right here it's pointing to uh, uh, yeah, Marge and uh, Lois it's I thought it was grandparents. What? I thought it was grand her grandparents. Nancy's? Uh, mm -hmm. No, it was her aunt. It was Lois and, and, yeah, and, and, and Cecil children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they wanted, memory of the the grandparents. they wanted it in the memory of the grandparents. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's, uh, why I got, that's why I get confused. Oh, okay, okay, okay. She didn't explain that part to me. But, okay. Um, Do we need to make a little plaque somewhere like probably. around the Probably. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Okay. I think we should, absolutely. And, I'm pretty yeah. sure it was, I'm pretty sure that's what it says. Help me more to get one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think we should make a plaque. I think that'd be good. Uh, wonderful. Uh, but they gave a card, and I'll go ahead and read it, and I'll decipher it to my best reading ability. <laughs> Did they not you cursive? It's not cursive. It Here's is the thing. cursive. It's, it's cursive. But it's sometimes it's the style. Everyone has a different style on how uh, when they write cursive, and uh, that's my most respectful and polite way of putting it. <laughs> uh, but it, it says to Corey in the Pangburn Church of Christ, my aunt Lois uh, Childers. Ch Childers. Childers. Childers and her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, L. M. in parentheses Lenny Crook. Uh, were longtime members of this congregation. Uh, Lois passed away April 23rd, uh, 2021, and, and trust, and something were given for their donation, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, be given in the memory of Mr. and Mrs. Uh, L. M. I will go ahead. Oh. And there's a photo of the Painburn Church of Christ taken in the early 40s. And Lenny and Marge are on the front row, directly in front of uh, the opening door. Uh, I will. Uh, 
author's read. Yes. Somebody can decipher that. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> I think I did, but I will pray that you use their gift in a more affectionate way to show, to share God's love and blessings in your Pineburn community. All right, thank you. And you can uh, pass an envelope around if you're interested and want to see the amount. It's a very generous amount. You know, I named it, I didn't realize, but I'm really thinking about Cecil. Must have been related in some way to the sales. No. It, no? It, it was Lois and, um, what yes. was Miss, yeah, they were sisters. Yes. He was sister and brother in law to uh, Mrs. Sell. That's what I was saying. There was a connection between yeah. Yeah. The, the Childers and the, and the Sells. Yeah. It was. Because he worked there forever. Yeah. It was his wife and Mrs. Sell and his sister. Yeah. Okay, that's what I. They kind of. They came here when we had homecomings. Mm -hmm. They, they were always those. here mm -hmm. homecomings. Lois and Cecil were. Yeah. While that is being passed around, uh, I'll go ahead and kind of give just um, a brief update. Uh, Sister Ruby is uh, still at the rehab center at the crossings at room 103. She is doing much better. The staff informed uh, uh, Carla, and Carla passed that information on to me and saying that she's been doing a lot better, improving greatly. Sister Marquita is still recovering from uh, the hospital uh, situation that she was in a couple weeks ago, uh, the intestines blockage, but she's been discharged now and she's at home, still recovering from her uh, broken leg. And also, Mary Fred, the last I was informed, she has been improving, correct? She's still yes. improving? Good. And Tuesday, yesterday, I uh, ran across uh, James, Brother James Moore, uh, in town here, and uh, he gave me a personal update on Stephen. Uh, he was moved to the rehab center uh, Monday. Yeah, so for the last few days, uh, the doctors uh, discharged him, saying that he is able to go to physical uh, rehabilitation, and he just was moved there Monday. And he says that so far he's able to push against you, he's able to squeeze, and he's able to, to write uh, briefly for a little bit. So he says that prayers are working, and so he says thank you to everybody for your love, your prayers, and uh, you're checking up on Stephen, and he asks that you just continue to be praying for him. Uh, that is all that I have so far. Is there anything that needs to be placed on the prayer list, updated or added? Pray for the water project that it's a good outreach. Absolutely. Did you get the did you get the thing reserved? I did. I haven't given any money, but I did she said she would save it for us. And mm -hmm. So we have our special spot, special which is spot. really the best I think it's the best yeah. place in the park. Mm -hmm. It is. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's like right there, like right when you walk in. <laughs> Mr. Hensley that died. Uh, Hensley from out, out at which one? He was 93. And I can't tell you his first name because I don't remember it. He had some girls. One of the girls. Um, now I think it's thing, but one of the girls worked. Was it Linus? Um, one of the girls worked at Walmart? No, worked at um, the catfish place down here. Part time. I think she did that on weekends. I don't know what a regular job was. I don't know. I don't reckon I do. Now, I know a bunch of Hensleys I went to school with them. Yeah. That, well, there was several families, I think. I yeah. mean, big families. So I, I can't tell you his first name. I didn't know. But. I hate not heard anything. Okay. We will go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. And then we'll begin our Bible class on James chapter 3. 
Heavenly Father, we come before you and uh, we thank you so much again just for this opportunity that we have of just being able to uh, come together and to continue on this amazing study through the book of James on uh, our desperate need of having wisdom from above. And Father, at this time, before we begin our Bible class, we just want to lift up uh, many who have uh, been on our thoughts and on our uh, minds and on our hearts that we've just been really thinking about and praying for. And we just want to lift all of them up uh, to you uh, by name uh, at your throne, for you already know the circumstance and the situation that they are facing. And so at this time, we ask that you just continue on being with Matt Klaus, uh, Cheryl Nolan, uh, Sister Mondelfia Warren, Bill Martin, uh, Mitchell, Stephen Moore, uh, Cleve Treat, uh, Ruby Billingsley, Sister Dot Humphreys, Henrietta Acock, Cindy Napier, Sue Treadwell, uh, Mary Fred and Sister Marquita. We ask that you also be with our outreach program uh, that is coming up pretty soon as we reach out to the community to build good rapport, to build good relationships with individuals, and to really our overall goal, bring lost souls to, you, to your son Jesus Christ. And it's our prayer through his name. Amen. All right, we're going to be in James chapter 3, and we are going to continue on with James is characteristics that portray wisdom from above. And we have already, last week, began looking at those characteristics. And which ones have we talked about so far? The wisdom from above. Uh, first, pure, peaceable, gentle full of mercy and good fruits without partiality or without hypocrisy. All right, excellent. And with James and his letter, what have I always said about the book itself? It is a practical commentary of what? The Sermon, Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. And so these characteristics that we see being portrayed of a person who has wisdom from above really can all point and go back to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we began by looking at pure. It's first pure. And what does pure mean? Without flaw. Without, Without flaw. Sin. Without sin. What else? Holy. Holy. That's the Greek word that is used here for pure. It is holy. Just as God himself is holy. And so we as Christians have been called to be what? To be holy. And so it's interesting that James says that this wisdom from above comes from God, who himself is holy, and is given to us who are called to be holy. So first, it is pure. It is genuine. It is real. It is without sin. It is unstained. It is unblemished. This is the wisdom that James says that we need to have so that we won't have any chaos, disorder, division, selfish ambition, or bitter jealousy towards one another. It's holy. It's not stained with partiality. It's not stained with favoritism. It's not stained with, um, with a backlash. It is pure. And so he says also, well, going back to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He then says that it is peaceable. And Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 and 9, blessed are the peacemakers for... They shall see God. That's, that's the pure in heart. The peacemakers for they shall... Inherit the earth. That's the meat. Yeah. <laughs> for they shall be called... Children. Children of God. And so, peace is the opposite of disorder. It's the opposite of disharmony. It's the opposite of chaos. It's the opposite of quarrels. It's the opposite of conflicts. Those who, in the church, who are causing friction, who are causing quarrels and conflicts and fights, over, uh, over matters where uh, that, that fall under opinions and out of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition not getting what they want 
they cause problems. James says that's not how you're supposed to be. A person who does that is a person who does not have wisdom from above. He then says it is gentle. Now, Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And what does this word gentle or meek mean? What did we say it means? Power under control. Power under control. Because what happens when, let's say, what happens when somebody's not controlling their tongue? What happens when they say something hurtful to you? What happens when they start quarrels and conflicts? Utter chaos. Utter chaos. Does that sound like everything's under control? No, it seems that everything is out of control. And so James says to avoid that, wisdom from above has gentleness. You're able to control the emotions that you go through whenever you are dealing with these kinds of situations. So a person who is looking uh, at things with a self-controlled mind, controlling their emotions, having everything under control, they are exhibiting wisdom from above. Unlike people who try to cause disorder, division, and chaos, no, they don't have things under control. They're making things out of control. He then says wisdom from above is reasonable, and this is where we finished last Wednesday. Wisdom from above is reasonable. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? For theirs is the kingdom, kingdom of heaven. And so what do we say this word reasonable means? What is a reasonable person, or who is a reasonable person? It's um, definitely someone who puts others first. Yes, it's definitely someone who puts others first. Because people, or at least in this situation, these teachers who are exhibiting wisdom from the world, they have what in mind? Themselves. Themselves in mind. They don't have others in mind. And so they, in their situation, they, they are coming across as being very dogmatic, as being very arrogant, as being very like opinionated to the point where if you don't even agree with me on my opinions, then no, we can't even be friends. We can't be unified. And so they're unreasonable people. But James says that with wisdom from above, you can have reason. And it all involves with what? Putting the other person before yourself. And so that is just really kind of a summary on the things that we discussed in regards to pure, peaceable, gentle, and reasonable. So let's continue on. What does James say next? Full of mercy and good works. Fruits. Full of mercy and good fruits. Now, in the Greek language, Mercy and good fruits actually combine as one. So we see mercy together with good fruits. Now, remember James earlier in chapter 2, verse 13, had already talked a bit about mercy. And what do we say that the term mercy means? Unmerited favor. That's grace. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, grace is good, too. I mean, that's a good answer. It's still a good answer because grace is good. We need grace. Mercy is forgive to, to me is forgiveness without any, um, like malice. God forgives us without malice. Yeah, without any... Without any, any grudge? Yeah, yes. without remembering what it was that we done, that we needed mercy for. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, see, forgiveness, that is actually one example of an act of mercy. And so, if you remember the definitions, anybody have it? Before? Okay. Well, it should be, like, in the notes back from chapter 2, verse 13, but it's okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and give it again. Please. It means to give something to someone... 
you cannot give it to themselves. You cannot yeah, give it to under. themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Giving something to someone, you cannot give it to themselves. Can I borrow a pen minute? Absolutely, yeah. Actually, I got plenty of those. You can just keep that one. Oh, thank you. So here, James combines mercy with good fruits. And in this context, when you see good fruits, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Fruit trees. Deeds and, and referring to other people, bringing people into the fall of God. Yes, deeds. Deeds. Yes, deeds. Let's go back to deeds. And keeping it in the context, remember what James says earlier on a person who has true wisdom from above. A person who has true wisdom from above will show it by his good conduct in the works of the meekness of wisdom. Verse 13. And so the good fruits refer to the good efforts that we put forth to help others because we are merciful. So in other words, mercy produces good fruits. So just like the brother or the sister, back in chapter 2, verse 15, who was in desperate need of food and clothing, they were not able to give the, the basic needs of life to themselves. Our sense of mercy and compassion will burst forth good fruits by assisting and meeting their needs. It is not just because some law requires us to do it, or because we feel, we feel compelled to do it, or obligated to do it, but it's out of our own sense of compassion we meet and assist their needs. This is the message regarding the parable of the Good Samaritan, back in Luke chapter 10. Now, if you remember, last Sunday night, I gave the three different uh, views when it comes to personal property. But now, let's look at the parable in the sense of what James is referring to as here. Think of it like this. When the poor traveler was beaten and robbed and left for dead, you would expect the priest and the Levite who passed by and saw him lying there to help. Because the man who was beaten and robbed was a Jew. The priest and the Levites were also a Jew. But sadly, they did not. Instead, out of those groups, who was the one who assisted the need of the man? Samaritan. The good Samaritan. The everybody no. spat on. What's that? The ones that everybody would have spat on. Yes, the ones that everyone would have spat on because the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along with one another. And so the Samaritan had true insight into God's perspective of people, while on the other hand, the priests and the Levites exhibited a wisdom that is not from above. When the Samaritan saw the beaten man left there for dead, he did not just see a Jew. He saw a soul. Again, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall what? No. <laughs> Think of it like this. They shall, mercy. Mercy. they shall obtain mercy. Yeah, yeah. Think of it like the boomerang effect. When you throw a boomerang, what does it do? Comes back. Comes right back at you. Yes. So I call that beatitude the boomerang effect. Mm -hmm. When you throw out mercy, it will come back to you one way or another. And God will make sure that it does because that's a guarantee and a promise. When you extend mercy, it will be given to you. And when you are extending mercy, you are operating by wisdom from above. Full of mercy and good fruits. What else does he say? It is... Without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. <laughs> without hypocrisy. Other versions may say unwavering. Now, the Greek word unwavering is the negative for the same word used back in chapter 1, verse 8, regarding the double-minded man. It says that he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, chapter 1, verse 8. So unwavering means not divided. 
being non-partisan. I have an example that I talked to you about it, about it earlier. And would this not meet the same criteria? The one that I was telling you about that said he didn't believe in cremation. Mm -hmm. But yet he turned around, he's making wooden objects and he's making wooden urns. 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 Yeah, yeah, cremation. cremation. Yeah. yeah. Does that not? Oh, that's wavering, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, that is wavering. I mean, that's especially if that's if, a hypocrite right there. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's a form of hypocrisy. Yeah. I mean, if he's outright spoken saying that Christians can't yeah, be he cremated. He don't believe in it, yeah, because yeah. he said, yeah, for one thing, mm -hmm. that you're not supposed to desecrate the body, mm -hmm. of, you know, and, then, and that we were made in God's eyes, mm -hmm. and he uses that, and then the part about ra being raised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Coming, I mean, that's, know, yeah, that's an example of use, having a double mind right there. If you use ashes, how can you write? He can raise your, your body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But he's making he made wooden it from arms. dirt, didn't he? Huh? He made it from dirt, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what Sue told him. That's what Sue told him, but he's still... Well, that's not a very pleasant thing for somebody. Some people, Some people yeah. To think about. Yeah, he just... It, yeah, he, so, but he used, but he was using it to make money. in a biblical yeah. way. You yeah. know, whenever he was talking yeah. about it, he was using it in a biblical way. Not that... You know, mm -hmm. but then he turns around and he's trying to sell wooden arms for cremation arms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the person doesn't believe in it and they use it biblically by not believing in it, I don't think you should be selling them arms mm -hmm. or even making them. You mm -hmm. know. Yeah. And I know that whole topic of cremation can be a very touchy subject, mm -hmm. and then that's. Again, that just falls under the matters of opinion. Right. I mean, if there's a brother or sister in here who says that, hey, I just want to make sure that I have all my organs ready, you know, when he comes back, mm -hmm. that's fine. That's absolutely okay. Yeah. I'm not going to yeah. shun them or I try to convince him, them otherwise. <laughs> I just told him that his soul he needs to worry about. True, that. that is. That's true. I mean, the <laughs> soul is the main thing. I mean, don't be so focused on the physical body when you leave here. I that's mean, what he's coming yeah. back for is the soul. The soul that's right. Yeah. Yes, he is. And so that should be another good point to share with them. Um, but yes, that is a good example of someone who would be representing as having a double mind. And so, but James says that the person who exhibits wisdom from above does not have a double mind. I mean, they, they stand firm. They stand firm in the doctrine. They stand firm in the faith. They stand firm in what Jesus has taught. And so, unlike the double-minded man, the unwavering man does not sway back and forth in his mind or thinking. He knows what God wants and will not change or compromise that. He knows where he stands and what is right and will not be persuaded otherwise. So he is nonpartisan in his treatment towards people. So he's what? Impartial. He's impartial. He shows no partiality. Chapter one, uh, excuse me, chapter two, verse one through thirteen. He extends mercy by meeting the needs of his brother or sister, regardless of their background, and, doing, and in doing so, proves his faith and produces good fruits. Chapter 2, verse 13 through 26. He then also effectively uses his tongue to bless his brothers and sisters, regardless of who they are and what their background is. He blesses them because an unwavering man is one who keeps his word. If he says that he will do something, you can bank on it, even if it costs the fellow more than he originally thought. He will not go back on his word, and again, Sermon on the Mount, what did Jesus say? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 through 37, let your what be what, and your what be what. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 King James, read King James. Yay be yay, and your nay be nay. <laughs> Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. And then so, wisdom from above is unwavering. We know what it is that God wants, and we're going to do it. We know what the one faith is of the body of the Christian uh, believers, 
We know what it is and we're going to stand fast in that faith and we're not going to be shaken or have second thoughts or doubts about it. He then says wisdom from above is without hypocrisy. And so unwavering and without hypocrisy in a way go hand in hand. But I found it interesting that James kind of separates these two right here. The opposite of hypocrisy. What is that? What's the opposite of hypocrisy? Being a hypocrite. What's that? Being a hypocrite. What the opposite? Not being. Of, yeah, not being a hypocrite. Be oh, not okay. be true to your word. <laughs> yes, be true to your word. Be true to yourself of who you are. The opposite of hypocrisy is to be yourself, to present yourself to others as you really are in accordance with your true beliefs. The man who has wisdom from above is real, genuine, and authentic. Man's reputation is his name. That's right. And he says that this Christian. is... What's that? <laughs> I said in the name is Christian. In the name is Christian, that's right. And bearing the name Christian, we are bearing the name of Christ. And Christ was true, authentic, and genuine, and was real as he could be. <laughs> Likewise, when we're bearing his name, that is how we're called to be as well. With wisdom from above, we are to be genuine, real. You get what you get. You tell others saying that this is actually how I am behind closed doors. This is how I am in public. This is how I am private. This what you is, see is what you get. What you see is what you get. Yeah. <laughs> Plain and simple. The hypocrite, however, puts on an act. That is the way of the world, but not the conduct of someone who possesses the wisdom from above. Do you know where we get this word hypocrisy from? It's from Greek, but... Actors upon a stage. Actors yeah. upon a stage, Yes. It is the Greek term for actor. It is the playing or acting of a part. And in Greek plays, the actor would certainly be pretending to be something he really was not. Some wear the mask of Christianity, sadly, but are really something else. <clears throat> we often hear this being the reason why many reject the gospel and why many of our uh, young adults, and maybe just not even young adults, but I would even say uh, middle-aged and even older folks end up leaving the church is because they say what? It's full of hypocrites. It's full of hypocrites, mm -hmm. they say. Yes, full of hypocrites. Well, they hadn't looked in the mirror. They haven't looked in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't stop them from going right. to the movies and yeah. shopping. What's that? Yeah. It does not stop them from going to the movies or shopping or other places. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing to go along the lines. Those are both great points. And let's go ahead and add a little bit more to those wonderful points that y'all made. First thing is that we often do need to acknowledge the fact that, okay, yeah, uh, there are there are and can be some hypocrites in the church. Uh, I've met plenty who have worn the mask of Christianity and who live a completely different lifestyle. Not, I'm not talking about when they're falling short and making a mistake. No, I mean, they genuinely live a different, complete lifestyle outside of the church. And so, first, we do need to acknowledge that. But then, secondly, we also need to ask them this question. Well, what does the world have to offer you? Because last time I checked, there's more hypocrites in the world mm -hmm. than there are in the church. <laughs> A lot of people come to church because they know that they need God in their life. <laughs> they need to be recharged. They need and want to worship Him. And they want to be with fellow like-minded brothers and sisters who think the same way, believe the same way, act the same way, and to recharge our batteries and to get away from the world. To get away from how the world is behaving. All you have to do is turn on the news and you can just really see how people are behaving. <laughs> So, last time I checked, more hypocrites in the world than there are in the church. 
Well, I think they look at people that come to the church that maybe what they're thinking is they think they're perfect. Mm -hmm. And Christians are not perfect. Mm -hmm. Christians make mm -hmm. mistakes. Yes, that does do. not make you a hypocrite. That's right. That means you made a mistake and That's you're right. trying to do something about that. Yep. Uh, and, you know, it's all in how you perceive yep. what's going on, whatever your goal is, or, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's why to them, you might be a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. You're in church, but you made a boo boo the other day. You know, yeah, and I saw you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. just I would say this in the mission field, we came from uh, it was not the popular thing to go to church, and mm -hmm. so the church was small, but they put up with a lot from the outside world, and mostly they were Christians because there was no advantage to be there. They knew they were going to be made fun of when they were. Mm -hmm. And when we came here, it was an eye-opener because when people said they were Christians, I was so thrilled that there were so many Christians. And then I saw them in the world and was utterly shocked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's go back to Gene's thought real quick. Now, the world does have, I guess, an unusual and I always go out and say wrong definition of hypocrisy. You know, they say that you make a mistake and then they call you a hypocrite. Now, but here's the thing. If they were to confront you and they were to see you in public making that mistake, what would you respond? How would you respond to them? I think you'd have to just admit that I have just made a mistake, mistake. And, yes. I, and I will work on that yes. to improve. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is wisdom from above. Own up to the forgiveness. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. own up to it. Ask right. for their forgiveness. And then explain to them saying that this is why I go to church, go to church. Or this is why I'm part of the body of Christ. This is why I go to worship and everything. Is because I know that I am perfectly am perfect. I like that. Right. We're perfectly am perfect. And it's not for perfect people. It, we are saved yes. sinners. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes, we are. <laughs> We're saved sinners. That's, that's exactly who we are. And the difference is that we have somebody who will forgive our sins and forget them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know, when we come to them in the right way mm -hmm. and you know, express ourselves to God, He He overlooks it once it's I'm so it's glad that. Absolutely. Ain't that the truth? Yes, ain't that the truth? And that goes back to full of mercy, right? Mm -hmm. It makes us go back and to think about how many times God has forgiven us and how many times that He's forgotten yeah. the things that we've done. <laughs> I'm gonna say something before I forget. You was talking about missionary work. Uh, I think it was Diane Yates. Somebody, oh, it's on the Pine Broom down memory lane, was talking about, it might have been Alice Solomon, I'm not sure, who said they was talking about coming, uh, they was overseas somewhere. And her husband was in the military, you know, I can't remember exactly where it was, but they had run into one of our missionaries that had preached here. One time they'd heard him preach here. And they ran into them where they sat. That's just <laughs> <laughs> one small world, huh? Yes. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so wisdom from above. It's first pure, then peaceful, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, and without hypocrisy. Our Lord's Sermon on the Mount is filled with instructions for us to not be hypocritical. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. When you give to the needy, sound no trumpets before you as the hypocrites do. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Do not put on a show 
so that people will think you are really religious when you are not. Any thoughts on any of the characteristics? This lesson humbles me because I don't live up to it, but then I go back and remember he said you've got to ask for it. Ask God for it. Yes. That's right. So we need to keep remembering that we've got to ask him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, here's a good thought right here, and this is again in more of a practical way. Remember going back all the way to chapter 1 about asking for wisdom from above. Here's the thing. God has already revealed his wisdom to us through his son, Jesus Christ, and has revealed it and delivered it to us through his son and through the 12 apostles. We have it right here. So now when it comes to asking God for wisdom from above, specifically, how does that look for us when we know that we already have it? Well, think of it like this. Maybe there's a struggle with purity in your life. Maybe there's a struggle with finding peace or being a peacemaker. Maybe you struggle with being gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, uh, struggle with unwavering, struggling uh, with uh, being without hypocrisy, or maybe struggling with partiality, struggling with um, not having an active faith. We ask God to show us how can I be better in being pure? How can I be better in being gentle, peace, uh, peaceable, uh, being reasonable? You name it. When you pray and you really want to improve yourself, God will give it to you. He will show it to you in his word. That is how it looks like for us when we ask for his wisdom from above. We pray saying, God, show me in your word. Teach me in your word on how I can be pure, how I can be peaceable, gentle, more reasonable, and etc. And God says that he will. He'll give it to you. You just have to ask with faith and trust without wavering and without having a double mind. Well, Midnight. <laughs> well, next Wednesday, Lord willing, we'll go ahead and finish up uh, verse 18 and then we'll start into chapter 4. Is there any other closing thoughts and remarks on verse 17 on about the wonderful, beautiful traits on having wisdom from above? It just kind of sums it all up. Yes, that one verse. Just yeah, it just rolls it all into one, absolutely. All right, well, if I can get Brother Randy to close us out in prayer, then you'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege and this day where we can come together and to study from your word. And we pray that what we've learned from these studies we can take and sh share with others. Thank you for the many blessings you've given us. We ask that you be with the sick that have been mentioned and we pray that they may regain their strength. Continue to be with us and bless us if it be your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have a little relative, young girl, that 